Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Yes, those anti-federalists, they did. They got it absolutely correct. And we're here on Liberty Works Radio Network, and this is Tom Navolis, your host, and I am absolutely delighted to be here with you today. Wow. It, it just amazes me that uh, on and on and on, the various things continue to happen in such exciting ways that... Uh, Wow, history is uh, something that I know is held in the hands of God, and yet we are required to live it out and to execute it according to his purposes and his will, which he does reveal if you take and, uh, you know, yeah, if you go and you study the Bible for yourself. Uh, as we get going today, we're going to talk a brief moment about those Ohio elections that I mentioned last Saturday. We're going to talk about a little bit about the results here in my county, which are very interesting and I think will be very telling uh, across the nation in some ways, as well as uh, we're going to talk about, uh, yes, uh, something of the Articles of Confederation, but where I'd like to spend most of the time is uh, talking about the Senate. And... Uh, it all falls into hand in the new book as I'm reaching over my shoulder for all of you on the radio and those that are watching uh, on YouTube. You can see that I'm actually pointing back at the book uh, From Covenant to the Present Constitution Workbook. And we have a first seminar for that here in Northeast Ohio uh, at the Chardon VFW on the 23rd of June. So I'll let you know about that a little bit more, and you will be able to find that. Uh, it will be up in the calendar uh, next week, so people can register, and that will be at the SamuelAdamsReturns.com site. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to start uh, where I promised you I was going to uh, start more often, is in my favorite little book, uh, They Preach Liberty. This is on free and loyal. Let us learn to be free and to be loyal. Let us not profess ourselves vassals to the lawless pleasure of any man on earth, but let us remember, at the same time, government is sacred and not to be trifled with. Let us prize our freedom but not use our liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. There are men who strike at liberty under the term li li licentiousness. There are others who aim at popularity under the disguise of patriotism. Beware of both. Extremes are dangerous. There is a present among us, perhaps, more danger of the latter than the former. So if you don't understand latter and former, uh, you can look that up. But uh, there's those that disguise themselves as patriots and under patriotism more than even the licentious, which we're seeing a lot of that out there. He continues with this, is that, uh, let's see, more danger of the latter than the former. For which reason I would exhort you to pay all due regard to the government over us, to the king and all in authority, and to lead a quiet and peaceable life. This was Jonathan Mayhew in 1750. Nothing new under the sun, ladies and gentlemen, as I always say. Nothing new under the sun. And... Uh, you know, the bottom line is uh, Samuel Adams and all those that came later uh, is to do what? Is to take, and we as individuals must take and be watchful. We must have watchful eyes, or in my case, a watchful eye upon government. That means local government as well as national. So... Let's get to some of the things in the Ohio um, election. Well, we have uh, someone, as my dad called, a lifelong Democrat who is a Republican, actually was in the Senate, was in Congress, is 
presently our Secretary of State and just won the primary for uh, the governor of Ohio, which is Mike DeWine. And my dad, is, he's just amazing. He goes, you know, this guy always voted like a Democrat. I didn't think he was anything other than that. So we'll see how that goes because now DeWine is going to be running against the secondary communist because uh, Kucinich did not make it, and Kucinich's platform was absolutely taken right out of uh, you know everything that Mao and Marx could ever write. So he <laughs> it would have been just amazing. He would have been worse than Jerry Brown is when you really come down to it for Ohio. But that doesn't mean that this other character that's running, and uh, his name slips me at the moment, isn't much better. I mean, he's just a more subtle communist. And these guys are communists, no different than Sherrod Brown, which takes me to the Senate race in Ohio. And uh, Senate race, I can understand why President Trump uh, did pick uh, Jim Renacci, who is a congressman. And uh, understandably, although uh, he did know his uh, Renacci's opponent, and was going to have him come in to the Assistant Secretary of Commerce, uh, that being Mike Gibbons. With Renacci being in Congress and understanding to a degree the swamp, um, you know, Renacci's he's, he's an okay guy, you know, to a degree. So we'll see what he ends up doing, and he's going to have a tough ba uh, battle against Sherrod Brown for sure because Sherrod Brown is a blatant communist. Uh, he was in the running for um, Hillary's uh, VP, potentially, back in the day. And so what we have to see is that you know he has a lot of stick in the Democrat Party, and uh, the guy's just a blatant uh, globalist communist. He's, okay, I'll give you a little credit. He's a neo-Marxist is what he is, all right? And so, you know, we'll just go with that. He's Give him that modern terminology, which I discuss in the book, is there's uh, all the various categories of the neo-Marxists. And uh, Sherrod Brown is right there with the big label all over his head and his chest, neo-Marxist. Okay. So that was kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, Christina Hagen lost to an establishment-backed uh, former professional football player, per former Ohio State guy. And, um, boy, I'll tell you what, uh, the establishment poured in millions of dollars. When you have uh, those um, that so-called business group, uh, you know, the, the, the something of commerce. Mm. Oh, the Chamber of Commerce, that's it. Really? Uh, they're for American businesses? I think not. I think they're for themselves. But anyway, you know, they put in a half million dollars or almost $800,000 against Christina. That was one organization alone that went after a young woman, very, very strong Christian constitutionalist, and uh, we'll have to see how the football player uh, can do you know, as he is moving forward in that uh, race for representative in, in that uh, area that Jim Renacci is leaving to run for Senate. <laughs> On a local note, i got to tell you, you know what? I'm going to be dead before the bond issue for the schools in my school district uh, is ever paid. I mean, come on, folks. 38 years to be taxing people? That's ridiculous. And uh, I just think that, you know, when it comes to schools and education, the educational system, as I've said over and over and over again, are out of control. Now, the deal is going to be a sweet deal for Kent State. you got to understand that because uh, the school district is buying and going to be building on and developing that property all around that Kent State campus and make this just one big campus of education in our school district and as a model for modern education. I doubt it. I doubt it. And what was real interesting is, is that the superintendent of schools tried to uh, sham 
uh, those uh, of uh, our friends out here that are the, uh, uh, come on, Kath, our friends that ride the horse and buggies, all of a sudden, our Amish friends, thank you. She put it out for me. Our Amish friends, they tried to, you know, sham and scam them, but the numbers didn't work out, so, you know, they're great at numbers, and, you know, wow. County commissioner race, yeah, I am taking up the whole segment here on uh, what happened in Ohio because I think this is going to be interesting across the, the country. County commissioner race, uh, the uh, opponent that ran against a constitutionalist sitting uh, county commissioner uh, definitely has no clue about governance. He thinks he does because he sat on township boards and this, that, and everything, but the guy was a Hillary and Obama Democrat turned Republican. Somehow he made it on the executive committee of the local Republican Party. And I'll tell you what, you talk about a sign war. He had the unions funding him. He had Democrats funding him. He was seen in the Democrat offices uh, I mean, it, it just was an onslaught of, uh, if anything, that defeated um, the sitting commissioner was the fact that this guy played an egregious, ugly, nasty sign war and to the fact that he made a lot of uh, misconceptions out there to the extent that he even disparaged my character and the things that I'm doing with the Geauga County Tea Party. So, interesting uh, fellow, don't know him personally, met him a couple times, not impressed with him as an individual, and I guarantee you he has no understanding of the critical areas of governance, nor do I believe he will stand and fight against the consolidation of governments. Uh, he will not fight against an organization called NOACA, he will not fight for our liberties, nor will he stand up for our property rights. So that's my opinion on him. And interestingly, is that what we're seeing on the initial analysis is that a, a lot of Democrats crossed over and voted in our county. And uh, I can believe that that's what threw the votes. And we're not finished looking at all the statistics. So all of you out there in the listening land, uh, it'll be interesting to look at the end run statistics to find out what happens, especially if a left-leaning, moderate, establishment type of Republican uh, takes and wins over a strong constitutional Republican, a Trump Republican for sure, uh, I would suspect that when one does the analysis, one may find that, yes, the uh, Democrats crossed over. We have an open primary, so all you have to do after you sign out up where you live, all that's required is say, oh, I'll take that color ballot. And the four ballots they had there, I think, was independent, Republican. Um, they had the Democrat and uh, they had one other party. I don't know. There were four slips, and they asked you to point at the, at the ballot type that you wanted. So you don't have to be registered party-wise uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, primaries in the state of Ohio, so you can get a lot of crossover votes like that, which probably for Trump was a good thing. You know, well, actually, it didn't work for Trump in Ohio because communist Kasich uh, won the Ohio primary. So with that, uh, it just becomes very, very interesting as now uh, there are other states that are moving in to finish their primaries here, I believe. Uh, and then as we move into the general, it is going to be a battle. And ladies and gentlemen, we absolutely need to get our feet out of our seats. Or shall I say better, our butts out of our seats and our feet feats on the streets because we have to be active. You are, I know, I'm preaching to the choir here on Liberty Works Radio Network, and I'm very happy that each and every one of you gets out there and is active, but I think there's still a lot of uh, lethargy inside of the citizens groups, and quit being emming, 
and get active. Get out, knock on doors, do those type of things that you need to do. And we're going to come back in the next segment because, yes, Samuel Adams has returned and those anti-federalists absolutely got it right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. They did. They absolutely got it right, and we're going to talk more about that here shortly. Uh, but I wanted to go back and remind you, as I always do in the beginning of this segment in particular, is to take a look at all of the other hosts and hostesses on the website. And as you can, please, I implore you to hit Donate, because, uh, you know, Liberty Works Radio Network is just a great network. A uh, lot of good folks out there, a lot of good uh, program, live program uh, programming during the week in your market areas. And uh, I do want to let you know that next week, and I'll finish up the last segment with it as well, is that next week we're going to be doing a live interview with an attorney friend of mine that wrote a book that is extremely interesting on uh, the courts and on the court system and I want to bring him in because what he has written uh, I've actually quoted some segments of his book in my new book and uh, because I found the value and the explanations of it were so different than anybody else especially on the 14th amendment I think the way that uh, he talks about it and some of the other things that will kind of key in next week. But join me next week for sure uh, to do a uh, interview. You'll see that on YouTube as well. And then the week after that, we're going to have the mystery author John Trudell uh, on the program. We'll do a phone interview with John. That should be a lot of fun. He does some great writing. I think that uh, he's very competitive to Clancy in many ways and we'll find out why when we hear more about John's background but as we get into more of what we're talking about in this segment you know the cost of liberty is where I read from and they preached liberty in that beginning of the last segment A couple of things that I just want to remind you of I'm not going to read that whole thing again but what I want to remind you of is that uh, let us prize our freedom you got to prize it and our liberty and we use our liberty and and you know but not for a cloak of maliciousness and that's what we're seeing uh, inside of uh, the educational system today is that especially in higher education academia is that it is so malicious inside of what's going on there that they use this idea of liberty and first amendment until it is something that's against the neo-Marxist ideologies of the universities and colleges. So with that, I will always plead for the uh, Betsy DeVos to shut down uh, what it is there to get Congress to shut down the Department of Education, and then I think we need to defund at the federal level every university in the United States. Okay, defund, because they're all communist in there. They're all maliciously abusing our liberties and the liberty that they have. And, uh, you know, then he talks about here, men who strike at liberty under the terms of licentiousness. And then there's those others that aim at popularity under the disguise of patriotism. And we see more of that, as he talks about, and more of that today then anything, oh, I'm a patriot. You really? You really? You, you're a patriot? You know, and the Democrats, you know, they're patriots to the neo-Marxist causes. And, uh, you know, that's just the reality of it. And I do really appreciate and enjoy a lot of Jonathan Mayhew, his sermons overall. Uh, I saw something on a social media environment the, this past week that was talking about uh, this whole aspect of things happening at the pulpit and how, you know, well, let me put it this way, not happening at the pulpit. And with that, they brought to a very uh, key point is, uh, you know, if we would preach, if we would preach as if I'm a preacher, right? <laughs> if I had a pulpit, I did that program already. Yeah. But, but if preachers, ministers, would take and just, you know, 
once a month preach a sermon from our foundation, that would just, I think, make all the difference in America. But then I made a comment back and saying, well, you know, they really can't do that, the majority of them, because they don't believe the gospel as it was preached at the beginning of this nation. Hmm, think about that one for a while. So if you don't believe the gospel, which means you don't believe the Bible as our founders did, as Sam Adams did, as those Puritans that came over on the Mayflower did, as those Presbyterians that went up and down the valleys in Georgia and so on and so forth and every other denomination that came to America that truly understood uh, the gospel of Jesus and the way that it came back into being in the Reformation, you know what? Taking and preaching any one of those foundational messages is useless unless you know what they could preach. Yeah, here it is. They could preach what the Anglican preachers preached that supported the Church of England, which was anti-liberty and anti-American in particular. Hmm, maybe that's what they're preaching already at the pulpits. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, interesting, ladies and gentlemen, what I really want to talk about is that when we look at things that happened inside the Articles of Confederation, one of the issues uh, that we have to talk about very, very seriously again is Article 3 and <coughs> portion of Article 4. Article 3 says, and I brought this up last week, but it, we, it bears repeating for a very significant reason, that the said states hereby se uh, severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defense, the security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare, binding themselves uh, to assist each other against all forces uh, offered to or attacks made upon them or any of them on account of religion, sovereignty, trade, or any other pretense whatsoever. Um, very interesting is that the states were always intended to support one another, and even in the Constitution, it talks about what that compact in many ways should be, but when we go back to understanding original intent, it's very, very important. Now, Let's segue over to the Senate. And I'm going to talk again what I did last week about Melanchthon Smith and during those debates uh, what he was arguing that the Senate would become. <sighs> Brutus argued what the Senate would become. Brutus, also out of New York at that time, Melanchthon Smith and Brutus both, as I corrected in uh, the uh, some of my notes and that, is that they were both at the New York convention, ratifying convention. Important to understand is that uh, the Senate, Melanchthon Smith in particular, I'll uh, go through that in a bit, was talking about the Senate in particular was to be that direct representative of the states and that the states needed to have recall authority over the senators when they got out of line. Now, Here's something that I want to take you through that just set me aflame. And not the brush fires of my mind, that was already aflame. That's a Samuel Adams thing. But I hope, yes, it does set the brush fires of your mind afire. It needs to. Because right now, I am very, very impressed by what, uh, what's his name, Peter Schweitzer wrote in his new book, uh, Secret Empires. I don't know if you folks saw the article out there that uh, has been validated, validated and confirmed uh, by other media outlets. You know, multiple establishment media outlets have now confirmed the s accuracy of Schweitzer reporting on McConnell and Chow's deep financial ties to China. Now, getting this. I mean, this blows me away. I can't, you know, I can understand now in reading this, uh, seeing some of the things that are happening with China, and, you know, I, I, but it just blows my mind and confirms when we talk about the swamp and incest inside the uh, hydra. 
the, the Hydra is self-perpetuating. You know, that swamp monster, that multi-headed beast is self-perpetuating. And it's self-perpetuating because of the incestuous relationships right here with McConnell and his wife. Well, wait a minute, they're married, so that can't be incestuous. But the evil perpetrated within this, and uh, I'll tell you what, McConnell's got to go, folks. You know, I wish that there was no 17th Amendment. I wish, in fact, that uh, Melanchthon Smith and what he was able to argue and get amended and make sure that it was in the, well, it was in the Constitution already, that the states were the ones that would manage or supposed to have managed this Senate and be able to recall them. I talk about this very uh, specifically in my book when I talk about the 17th Amendment. I don't get into all the heavy details because I think some of the best documentation out there is done by Debbie Kidd. But at the same time, I covered this whole thing. And this is exactly what the Anti-Federalists called the oligarchy of the Senate. First of all, these people, these human beings, should not be lifers in government. And the fact that they are incestuous and their families should never, ever, ever hold a bureaucratic office. It's not just that they should not hold a bureaucratic office while they're in as an elected official, but the founders intended that their families should never hold a bureaucratic office at the federal level in particular. So we're going to get into this a little bit more about, and I'm going to reference for you again, Melanchthon Smith section about the Senate, and I may put in Brutus about the Senate because this nails it. And the 17th Amendment was mo one of the most evil things perpetrated on the American people by Woodrow Wilson. And I'm going to put another good article from a, pa a really cool pastor, actually, <clears throat> about Woodrow Wilson and what happened with all of these various evils. But let's start going through. Now, now there's an article here that it's called Seven Explosive Secret Empires Facts About Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chow. Now, we're going to start on those here in this segment. We'll finish them up in the last segment. And uh, so here we go. Number one, confirm Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow's sister, Angela Chow, currently sits on the board of directors of the Communist Chinese Government's Bank of China. Wait a minute. So, wait a minute. I didn't check in. Maybe you could go do this. Is she an American citizen or is she a Chinese citizen? If she's a Chinese citizen, well, then she can't sit on that board of directors. But if she's an American citizen, how is she sitting on the board of directors for a communist bank? Hmm. <clears throat> Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so let's get to item number two. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, oh, with that one, go check out the Bank of China's website. And you know what? I, I don't care. This article is on Breitbart, but I am. It, it's in the references uh, on the program, so it's in there on YouTube, or if you didn't get the newsletter, or <coughs> those that did get the newsletter with the promo for the program, it's uh, there, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so as we're getting ready to wrap up this segment, think about this. Mitch McConnell and Elaine Chow received 5 to eh, $25 million from her father, James Chow, whose shipping company, Foremost Group, does massive deals with the Chinese government. Hmm... Yeah, they got a gift. They got a gift. Yeah, Mitch and Mitch, Mitch and Elaine. Well, I, you know, it wasn't a wedding gift because they're a little beyond that. But uh, somewhere in 2008, they got between five to 28 million, and we see that his net worth or their combined net worth went up uh, from 2004 of about 3.1 million uh, to between 9.2 and 36 million uh, in a recent filing. So we have to think about those are just two items that make my hair go on fire. I got to get one of those hats where your hair goes on fire. I think yeah, I was going to do that for my business book was a hat with a hair on fire. I think that'd be kind of fun and interesting uh, to do that. But uh, <clears throat> when we 
need to come back in the next segment. We're going to follow up, picking up with number three in that, and prove again that the Anti-Federalist absolutely got it right here at Samuel Adams Returns on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty does work for you. Come on back for that last segment. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists got it right. And yes, I am absolutely picking on Mitch McConnell and his wife because the anti-federalists predicted this. They predicted everything we have, including John McCain and so many other in the Senate, is that it is an oligarchy. You see, uh, if I can find the words again, some of the things that uh, he was talking about in here, he being Melanchthon Smith, is that a uh, great number of men will take and uh, you know step away. They, that, that people will no longer have uh, confidence in representation. Uh, they won't have any confidence at all in what's going on in Congress, especially with the Senate. Oh, gee, duh. Look at the numbers. I mean, the polls just absolutely prove is what? Congress has like got the worst uh, popularity ratings or job rating than, you know, I think the, you know, uh, dog poop scooper dupers. And those poor guys are making a hard living. They're working for it, you know, and what they're doing. And, uh, you know, it's the old uh, Navy terminology of right now, Congress is lower than whale dung. Uh, at the bottom of the ocean so you know well and the navy has said it a little differently but you know you, you kind of get my drift uh, in what that is so let's go here is that uh, you know he goes into all that there should be a power of recall which i talked about in the last segment and that it uh, is uh, something that the states need to have uh, over those uh, in the senate that the Senate has been generally held up by all parties as a safeguard to the rights of the states. Well, when they turn into an oligarchy, and what we see and what he talks about in here, as you can surmise when you go through and read this section, and this was on June 25th, 1788, in those discussions, is that if the Senate becomes an oligarchy, they will represent no one but themselves. Jeez, Mitch McConnell and his wife, Elaine Chow. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, you're looking at a great number of men for doing nothing. Hmm. Paying a, <laughs> gee, exactly what we got going on in the Senate. A bunch of guys doing nothing. Uh, and yet they have the power. They have the power over us. And at that time, it was the power over the states. Uh, let's see. There was other arguments and a number of officers and talking about some comparisons in the federal government that uh, there's a, a, what about the judicial officers? Oh my goodness, it just goes on and on and what he's talking about here. And uh, oh, I didn't mark it specifically where I wanted to talk to you about it. But uh, what he brought out very clearly is that when there is a insignificant rotation uh, within the Senate, which I brought up last week, then what you have is the potential of these guys being in there for life. And as a result, you have the formation of an oligarchy. Wow. <clears throat> so let's see what's happening in uh, the oligarchy with Mr. McConnell. And his lovely wife, uh, Miss Chow. And uh, let's see, father in law, honorable father in law in 2000 Senate. Let's see, just as the U.S. Senate was taking up sensitive legislation concerning China, uh, the Mr. James Chow's holding company, CSSC Holding LTD is the uh, with the financial arm of Chinese government military, that's CSSC, named a James Chow to its board. Well, wait a minute. Here is the primary military contractor for the communist Chinese government 
naming this guy to the board uh, during the time. Oh, and then it goes on to show here that uh, CSSC Holdings also added Elaine Chow's sister, Angela, who sits on the bank, the Communist Chinese Bank, added her to the board as well. My goodness gracious, you know, I, I'm not even getting into all of this stuff. You know, that, that how is it that these two people end up on the board of two major Communist Chinese entities? can't even call them companies because they're entities because everything's owned by the Communist Party. So number three, here's another one that was confirmed. Uh, since Elaine Chow became Transportation Secretary, her family's company, Foremost Group, has ordered 10 massive cargo ships from the Communist Chinese government's China State Shipping Corporation. That's CSSC. Now, that's the same corporation that takes and makes the Chinese submarines that Clinton gave the uh, propeller in the Navy. We call them screws. And we did get screwed because that's what Clinton did was give them that information on how to make a silent screw. So <laughs> Trump gets it right as we're getting screwed silently by the Chinese, and now we're seeing overtly. But thank you, Mr. Trump, for, and President Trump for you know, taking the screw out of things. <clears throat> Anyhow, beyond that, this guy orders 10 ships, and he gets them because he's on the board of directors for the, this communist military entity, and so is his daughter. Oh, my, all right. Number four, confirmed, confirmed. Since becoming U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow and her father, James Chow, have appeared in at least a dozen Chinese media interviews, including foreign interviews that featured the Department of Transportation symbol and her father's book. <laughs> you know... If anybody's homes and offices should be raided, and you uh, on the radio, you don't see me putting my uh, head into my hands, but if anybody should be raided, it should be both McConnell and Chow's home and their offices. And uh, I mean, what is it using? Uh, anyway, you can figure it out. You're smart enough. You, you, you read this article, your head's going to explode too. You know, you should be taking and jumping up and down telling Trump to fire this woman. Oh, wait a minute. If he does that, mm, McConnell will become extremely evil more than what he is already and will never see another confirmation of any of Trump's people. Do you wonder why McConnell slow rolls stuff? Hmm. Maybe we should start taking some harder looks. This is what I talked about in the first segment as we closed out, <clears throat> where, you know, here it is in that sermon was to keep a watchful eye, to keep that watchfulness over what's going on in government. I know the media is telling you, you know what? That's our job. We're supposed to do that. Mainstream media, we're supposed to be having that and taking care of that for you. We're going to be your watchmen on the wall, your watchdogs. And everything that we're doing is we're watching hard and we're going it after everything with a vengeance after Trump. Think about that. Oh, well, what about McConnell? What about all of these other sleaze ball? oligarchy people that are making millions and I think Rush Limbaugh pointed out this week you know can't point any fingers but why is Obama and Kerry and all of that so upset about getting out of a personal deal remember the Iranian deal was a personal deal of Obama it was not anything that was ratified by Congress, and it had no counter signatures of the other parties, especially the Iranians, when it came to what the deal was all about. So this was just an Obama deal. Hmm. How many planes has Boeing sold to the Iranians? How much other business has been done internationally as well from U.S. companies? Go, President Trump, and put those hard pounding sanctions back on the Iranians and put the kibosh 
on, oh, you know, one of the people should be, uh, let's see, Elaine Chow's father. Because here we go, number five, confirmed James Chow and his daughter Angela Chow sat on the board of one of the communist Chinese government's largest military contractors. Well, we already said that, didn't we? Yeah, but I mean, it's even confirmed even more once again that the China State Shipbuilding Corporation and its subsidiary, DDDDD, CSSC Holdings, they're on those boards. Hmm. Number six. Uh, come on down. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Number six. We have videos uncovered by Politico reveal James Chow on camera with Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow signaling Gonzi, the Chinese concept of personal power due to relationships. Whoa, 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 whoa. So what's the difference between Obama taking and making a personal guarantee to the likes of Iran? And think about this one. <laughs> I thought that, that Kathy and I were talking about this the other day. <clears throat> Just think about this, is that all of those pallets of $1.5 billion in cash that went to Iran in that secret airplane unmarked. Okay, get it. All of you that are smarter than me, you absolutely know that every bill that gets put into circulation is uh, documented and cataloged in such a way that its life cycle is forever maintained until it's taken out of circulation. Really? So you have $1.5 billion shrink-wrapped on pallets delivered to Iran. So that means that this money that had no authority by Congress to give to the Iranians, the only way that that could be of unmarked bills was that they came fresh off the printing press. Think about this one. They came fresh off the printing press by Obama's personal order and guarantee to the Iranians. So in my simple, uh, where is the Secret Service and where is the U.S. Marshal, to me, that is using the U.S. Mint to take and counterfeit money Oh, I can't say that. It wasn't counterfeited because that means it has to be done by somebody else. But here's money that doesn't go into circulation, doesn't get uh, archived into the system. Well, to me, you know, technically speaking, that is counterfeiting. All right. Anyway, so Chow does this head nod, the Chows. Chow Chow does a head nod, uh, taking and uh, giving... Uh, this whole idea of uh, these Asian Americans in America, but at the same time has something to do with a personal power signal. Hmm, there's a whole bunch in here on that. I think it's extremely interesting that you go through and read the rest of that. It's just amazing. So here's number seven, as we're running out of time. Confirmed! Mitch McConnell and James Chow traveled to China as guests. Whoa, that's illegal. As guests of the China State Shipping Corporation and met with former Chinese President Zheng Zemin, a former classmate of Chow's. Well, so ladies and gentlemen, just slap me down. Uh, you know what? Kathy had to take and uh, get uh, a 10-gallon bucket of water. I didn't have a 10-gallon hat to put on. She just had to get a 10-gallon bucket of water to throw on my head as it went up in flames. So if you think about what the anti-federalists talked about relative to what the Senate could become, their predictions have absolutely come to fruition. And everything they talked about as an oligarchy, as well as the corruption 
that would happen within the context of the Senate is solely, if not extensively fulfilled across all of the Senate, maybe except for a few, it is all right there in Mitch McConnell and his wife. Wow, Mr. Trump, President Trump, I sure hope you're listening because Samuel Adams is coming back again next week. The Anti-Federalists, they absolutely did. They got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network.